Amen. Thank you for that. Thank you for the wonderful music, our, our guest musicians, while uh, our choir is on break. But this has been a wonderful Sabbath so far. And I am glad that, uh, as I said before, our Christmas decorations are still up. Um, as you may know, the old uh, tradition of the 12 days of Christmas, today would be the sixth day of Christmas. So w Christmas is only half over, those of you who are worried that we're dragging this on too long. Uh, you know, I was told recently, Christmas, I think, stands for such a profound truth of God taking on human flesh that it can't be contained in just one day, but it gets its own season. We're called again and again to meditate our minds on this great mystery. And so today's gospel reading picks up shortly after the birth story, this Christmas narrative. Uh, having been born in Bethlehem and having been circumcised on the eighth day, uh, in keeping with the law of Moses, the Gospel of Luke tells us that when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law, every firstborn male should be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So according to the command laid out in Leviticus, this sacrificial offering would take place 40 days after the child's birth. Mary, as a woman who gives birth to a son, must go on the 40th day to receive a ceremonial cleansing. That's what the sacrifices are for. And likewise, Jesus, as the firstborn son, must be dedicated to the Lord. So Joseph and Mary are compelled by the law of Moses to bring an animal sacrifice to the temple priest. Now the law says, in fact, that they are required to bring a young lamb, less than a year old. But Moses says that if she cannot afford a sheep, she shall bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons. So when Luke tells us that Mary comes offering these two birds, he's reminding us of the poverty of Mary and Joseph. That they can't afford the normal sacrifice that the law would require. And the fact that Mary and Joseph can't afford the traditional sacrifice reminds us of a most crucial and central component of this whole sacrificial system. And I think we have a tendency to forget it, or at least overlook it. And that is that sacrifice is costly. Now, you might think, well, that's the most obvious thing that anyone knows about sacrifice, is that it's costly. This is the way we use the expression all the time. If we talk about, uh, you know, a mother that has sacrificed so much for her children, what do we mean? But the things that she has given up, the things that she has lost, what has come at a cost to her for the benefit of her children? Time can be sacrificed. Money can be sacrificed. A career or ambition can be sacrificed. And all of this comes at the cost of the one who is sacrificing. So why do I say that we have a tendency to overlook the costliness of sacrifice? Well, it seems to me that when we think about the sacrifice of Jesus we throw out of our minds everything that we know about sacrifice. There's a tendency to think that Christ's sacrifice comes at his cost and not at our cost. That the sacrifice of Christ means loss to Jesus, but it means strictly gain to us. But in framing it this way, we have missed the first and most obvious point of the lesson of animal sacrifice, which is that it comes at a price, not just to the victim, obviously, but to the one offering the sacrifice. You see, the one who brings sacrifice and the sacrificial victim become one in the act of sacrifice. Now that is very much my central point this morning, so I, I'm just going to say that one more time so that you can get it. The one offering the sacrifice and the sacrificial victim become one with each other 
in the act of sacrifice. Just ask the young couple of Mary and Joseph if sacrifice comes at a price to them. And obviously it does, because they couldn't even afford uh, the typical sacrifice that God would have demanded. But Mary comes to the temple not just with her animal sacrifice of two young pigeons. She also comes to offer her first and only son. You see, God made a claim on the firstborn son of all the families in Israel. He claimed them as his own. And so they were brought to the temple and dedicated to the Lord. They were offered up. This tradition clearly echoes uh, the story of Abraham, who was commanded by God to take his son Isaac and sacrifice him. Now, of course, God in the end does not want Abraham to take his son's life, but he does want Abraham to demonstrate his total willingness to surrender his son to God and to God's will. He is, in a real sense, sacrificing his son. This is why God says to him in Genesis 22, because you have done this and have not withheld your only son from me, I will indeed bless you. And in much the same way, when a woman would bring her firstborn son to the temple, the most economically valuable of her children, she would dedicate him to the Lord, offer him up in a sense, acknowledging that this son no longer belongs to her, but belongs to God. Now, unfortunately, this understanding of sacrifice, of, of giving over both of the gift and ultimately of ourselves, right? Because when a person dedicates their child, it's not just the child that's being dedicated, but you as a parent now see your child differently. It's given back to you as a gift, not something that you own, but something that you're a steward of. So this idea of our participation in the sacrificial act is something that we've missed because we've become so fixated on this idea of substitution, the idea of God demanding blood as a substitution, as if God were saying, I ought to kill you, but instead I will kill this innocent animal. I think that's what certainly I grew up being told, and I think that's what many of us have been told. But not only is this problematic because it depicts God as literally bloodthirsty, but it also has the unfortunate consequence of, of making us think that Christ's suffering, the one whom all these animal sacrifices point forward to, makes us think that Christ's suffering is somehow instead of our own suffering. When we don't realize that far from Christ's suffering instead of us, we are called to suffer with Christ. When the Bible says that he is the Lamb of God, he is our sacrificial offering. We are the ones who offer it to God, and we then are called to participate in that sacrifice, not be substituted by it. And perhaps we have come to think of the sacrifice of Christ as something so distant from us, something so removed in time and space, so sanitized, because we ourselves have been so removed and distant, have become distant from the practice of animal sacrifice. But any person in the ancient world would have known that the one offering a sacrifice and the sacrifice being offered are one with each other. Nothing could be more obvious to a rural shepherd in ancient Israel that to sacrifice a lamb, a spotless and healthy lamb, comes not only at a cost to the lamb, but at a cost to the shepherd. Now our gospel continues now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. His name, Simeon, comes from the Hebrew word Shema, meaning to hear. That most famous of Hebrew prayers, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu, 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. Simeon is the one who hears. Simeon is the one who is attuned to God, who, as the Bible says, is guided by the Spirit. Luke goes on to say, It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. So guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. You see, Simeon, incidentally, is a great example of this spirit of sacrifice that we're discussing this morning. For when he sees the Christ child, what does he say? But Lord, now let your servant go in peace. You see, God does not demand Simeon's life, but he offers it up freely. And why? Because he recognizes that to see God as he is doing now, to come face to face with his creator is the greatest fulfillment of the human soul. There is no greater happiness than to encounter God face to face. And so having secured the one thing, the one thing that could ever matter, that is to see God, he relinquishes control of his own life. So overwhelmed by the presence and the satisfaction of being in God's presence, he surrenders his life up to God. He says, Lord, now let your servant go in peace. And as he holds the infant Jesus in his arms to dedicate him to the Lord, to offer him up like Isaac, he joins himself to that offering. He gives himself over to God. For my eyes have seen your salvation, he says. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother, Mary, this child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel. Now this prophecy seems as if it's saying that Christ is destined to cause ruin and success for many. This child is destined for the falling and rising of many. And certainly there is a sense in which that is true. Just one chapter earlier, Mary had said uh, in her song, You have cast down the mighty from their thrones and have lifted up the lowly. So there are some that God brings down and some that God lifts up. But I think Simeon's prophecy here has, in fact, a deeper meaning because he says literally that the child is destined for the falling and the getting back up of many in Israel. He uses in Greek the same term that is translated throughout the rest of the New Testament as resurrection. So we could say, in other words, that Simeon's prophecy is that this child is destined for the death of and resurrection of many. You see, Simeon is the one who hears. Simeon is the one who is in tune with God. He understands the clear message of Scripture that we have such a hard time accepting, which is that there is no resurrection without death. We want the joy of coming back to life without the pain of losing life. But the Bible will tell us clearly that sharing in the life of Christ means also sharing in the death of Christ. Paul tells the Philippians, he says, For his sake, for Christ's sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. You see, not only does Paul believe that Christ has suffered for his sake, he believes that we too are called to suffer for Christ's sake. He continues, I regard all things as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. I want to know Christ and the power of his, resurrection, of his resurrection. And I hope we can agree with that. We want to know Christ. We want to experience his resurrection by sharing 
in his sufferings. By becoming like him in his death, Paul says, so that I may somehow attain to the resurrection from the dead. The Bible is clear. We have a share in Christ's resurrection as a consequence of being joined to his sacrifice. So I believe that Simeon foresaw in the death and resurrection of Jesus, the death and resurrection of all those who would be joined to him, all those who would be one with him. He saw the falling and rising of many in Israel. Simeon will then go on to say, and he, that is Jesus, will be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed. In other words, when the nation has Christ put to death, their own true selves will be revealed. And while speaking of the death of Christ, he says to Mary, and a sword will pierce your soul too. A sword will pierce your soul too. Just last night, I was speaking with someone who uh, has a, a son who's off at school, and he'll be returning later this week, and just talking about uh, the pain of that kind of separation. I know those of you with, with children who are, who are off somewhere else, you know what that's like. I know even for myself, my own family, saying goodbye is always hard. Now imagine a mother looking up at her dying son. By no means could we ever say that the son suffers instead of his mother. No, a sword will pierce your soul too. I can't help but think of the famous sculpture by Michelangelo, the, Pie the Pieta, which depicts the body of Jesus having been taken down from the cross and laying in Mary's lap. Imagine the scene and tell me what exactly it is that Mary has been spared from. Far from it. Instead, we see a fulfillment of this prophecy of Simeon, a sword will pierce your own soul too. And Mary, in this case, is a model for all Christians. At the cross, it is not only the body of the Lord that is pierced, but his mother's heart. And in this way, she becomes an example for us who are called to be crucified with Christ. With this image of her pierced soul, we are reminded of the command of Christ. If anyone would be my disciple, let them take up their cross and follow me. Mary, perhaps more than anyone, knows what it means to truly be crucified with Christ. She shows us how we ought to relate to the cross because she is one who shares in the pain of the cross who participates in that sacrifice. And so, in closing, if we ever wonder what that looks like, what this means practically to share in the sufferings of Christ, what does it mean to have our soul pierced like Mary? What does it mean to take up our cross and be crucified with Christ? It means, quite simply, I think, to live a life of detachment, to acknowledge that your life is not your own, but you belong wholly and completely to God. The Apostle Paul himself summarizes it best when he says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let this same mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so I urge you, as we stand at the beginning of a new year,
to dedicate yourselves to the Lord, to be like Abraham, to be like Simeon, to be like Mary, who through their faith and their obedience joined themselves to the sacrifice of Christ. And as we take time each day to stand before the cross and contemplate the sacrifice of Christ, may we, as the Bible says, die daily. Let us participate in the sacrifice of Christ by offering our own bodies as a living sacrifice.